Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's not an academic quarter, it's five over. It's new new rules of KTH now. We're just starting it because we promised to start at one, one o'clock. Welcome to um, what we called Athena series. And we also have another Athena series at the Center for Future Places, but that one is exclusively dedicated to female distinguished scholars. And it's one time thing with the 20 scholars. But the Athena lecture series has been running uh, almost, uh, I would say, eight years back when we had the Civitas Athenium Laboratory. And that is a series of international guests uh, coming to KTH and presenting their latest work, and um, uh, usually we have four or five speakers per year. So I think the last speaker before Nikos was Kim Bilby from Australia. I, some of you might remember that. My name is Tigran Haas, and I'm the director of the Center for the Future of Places, which is um, situated at the School of Architecture and the Built Environment. It's a center that does interdisciplinary research uh, on uh, within urbanism, but focusing on the public realm quite a lot. So uh, we have a great pleasure today to uh, uh, welcome our guest speaker and my colleague, Dr. Michael Mahaffey, who's been uh, the guest scholar at our Center for the Future Places for the two years, and now he's working for the Axelson Johnson Foundation. We'll make the uh, sort of the form of in, uh, introduction to our guest speaker, Professor Nico Salingaros from the University of uh, um, San Antonio in Texas. Uh, so um, that's much from me. And then the format is that Nikos will give a talk around 45 minutes. And after that, we'll have a lively, hopefully lively discussion and QA session after. So Michael, please. Thank you, Tigran. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, my great friend, Nikos. Uh, who, as many of you may already know, is a physicist and a mathematician, and he actually teaches mathematics. Uh, and he was working on uh, the story about uh, Nikos was that he was working on uh, fusion technology, you know, and the big tokamaks and the uh, very sophisticated uh, fusion stuff. And he became persuaded at some point that actually urbanism and cities are way more important than this other stuff that he was working on. And so he he brought his understanding of complex systems and of um, you know, the way the systems evolve and adapt and become more resilient uh, to the field of urbanism and has gotten very interested in things like biophilia, uh, things like how um, uh, forms evolve and change over time, including forms in the city. Uh, and in that connection, the work of our great friend uh, Christopher Alexander who, as uh, many of you may know, is a pioneer of um, uh, design theory, and, uh, and many of Christopher Alexander's ideas led directly to uh, some of the cutting-edge computer technology today, things like Wiki uh, and Agile and Pattern Languages of Programming that came directly out of uh, uh, Christopher Alexander's theory, uh, which is not very well known, but. Um, my colleague Ward Cunningham, who works with us, uh, uh, has written a paper. Uh, and uh, Ward Cunningham is the guy who actually invented Wiki. Um, so that's another whole fascinating dimension of this. But I think it's fair to say, Nikos, that your uh, focus uh, is really on uh, how cities serve humanity and how we know that from the evidence, how we can actually use uh, research in things like neuroscience and uh, cognition, uh, environmental science, environmental psychology, to make better cities and to learn from the good quality cities that we already have. So on that note, I'm delighted to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Nikos Salingaros. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I uh, thank you uh, here at KTH University and the Center for the nice invitation for me to talk today, it's a pleasure. It's been a busy trip with all sorts of uh, uh, presentations, social functions, dancing, and uh, it's a delight, but <laughs> it is tiring. It, it, it's a full trip. So uh, this is going to be a more uh, academic lecture. And uh, the, the announced title is Science, Biophilia, and the Evolution of Architecture. Let me begin with science. Uh, what is new? Uh, with uh, science and the application of science to what we're doing, as my Michael put it very succinctly. Um, the study of cities and how they provide a better environment for human beings. 
So what do we know about science and especially what are new developments in science? Well, going back to, to Christopher Alexander's work, even in the 70s, the approach of, of Christopher was to understand mechanisms that uh, make a city uh, uh, a better environment. Better from a very specific point of view, for the health of the individuals. Health, physical health, mental health, well-being of the uh, in, uh, inhabitants of the city, which is very specific but uh, difficult to achieve. And uh, Christopher, beginning with, um, with the pattern language, which is a book in 1977, gave a description of discovered results that can be applied to design a better city, healthier city. So the pattern language, for those who know, this book contains just uh, 230 some patterns and on different scales from the size of a city to a neighborhood to a uh, building to a room to a windowsill. So these are rules that were discovered by, uh, by Christopher Alexander and his friends uh, at that time and were documented and we put out for free. One of the first uh, examples of, uh, of free code put out because Christopher wanted uh, architects and urbanists and government planners to use this free code in order to create better cities. Some of them followed this and created very nice part of cities. Some did not and created horrible, un inhuman, oppressive and unhealthy cities as, as we know now. Um, so behind, uh, behind the idea of discovering rules for making a better environment is also Christopher Alexander's philosophy that when we discover something that's good for humankind, we publish it for free. Well, the book is not for free, but the book you can buy for $35 rather than $240 a Springer Verlag book. So it has always been, been affordable. And uh, uh, Michael and I, who have collaborated with other, uh, with other collaborators, uh, have continued in this, uh, in this uh, uh, philosophy, we discover something and we put it as a, as a freely available paper or uh, put together some papers uh, into a book that um, uh, we, we don't publish with Springer, we publish with a, with a more modest uh, press that makes a book available for 20 euros instead of 200 euros. So it is available for students. So uh, let me get now to the results. What are the sort of results uh, from the patterns in the 1970s, uh, then Christopher Alexander developed more geometrical rules like uh, 15 properties. And some of the 15 properties say that uh, you have a hierarchy of scales. So let me just um, mention the hierarchy of scales. In a city or in a building or in a room or in a window, what responds most to the, to the human body is design that has a structure that has many different scales. Something this large, something this large, something this large, something this large, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, so we see that in traditional cities, traditional buildings, traditional artifacts, namely not only artworks, but utilitarian, a, 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 a um, fork that you eat with. A, and, 18th century fork has this, these different levels of scale, also fits a hand better. When you eat your potato, the hand feels better. Now you, you get a contemporary, it's so difficult to buy a fork today that fits the hand. And it's usually made to look design. Okay, the scales are missing. But has anyone considered, aside from our friends, that by making a design, by getting rid of the scales, it also doesn't fit the hand. So this, this silly example of a fork goes for the city. You eliminate the scales by putting giant buildings that don't fit the human, the human body. There is no place to walk. When you try to enter a building, there is no entrance. It's all glass, which is the entrance. Well, you have, to look, you have to walk along very hard and you see a little sign, entrance. Okay. This morning I walked in front of the, uh, of the opera house. 
you can see the opera house from kilometers away. There is a hierarchy of scales, namely larger scales, smaller scales, smaller scales, smaller scales. Beautifully designed, you may, not, you may or may not like the gold, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the hierarchy of scales. You walk towards the opera house and you know this is the entrance. You're drawn to it. It begs you, come. It is warm, it is inviting, it is human. You go towards the entrance, you go up the steps, and then the doors are, have different scales. And then you actually touch the door. I, I couldn't go here, <laughs> I pushed the door, you can't go. But you touch the door and you see the door itself is subdivided into different scales. We don't notice it, but this is a mathematical, a mathematical structure of the different scales that correspond to the human being and the handle of the door is itself subdivided and has some curvature. So you touch the handle like I did and it feels comfortable, like the 19th century, 18th century spoon. It feels nice, whereas contemporary handles, there's just a bar there. It, it doesn't fit the hand and then you say, am I going to push or pull? The good handle, you don't have to think about it, the good handle, you, you grab it and you know instinctively if you're going to pull or you're going to push because the, the, the form tells you instinctively. So, so that we, we can negotiate the city and, and we enjoy interacting with other people because it is a friendly environment. And why is it a friendly environment? Because of the geometry. So the mathematics goes a long way to guarantee a human environment. Of course, a city depends on many factors not only the geometry, but a geometry is a precondition to, uh, to everything else. And then you have the transportation uh, and, and the, the, uh, the ability to, uh, to move, the path structure, that's, that's, those are separate issues and weather, protection from the weather and whether it's a, it's a nice uh, area or if there's a crime. So th these are separate issues. We cannot solve everything with, uh, with, with, just, the, with just mathematics. So um, here uh, I have uh, mentioned one mathematical rule, which is the hierarchy of scales. And it's not enough just to have different scales. Those scales must cooperate because you can have a subdivision like we, we don't have any subdivisions uh, here in this room. But if you have subdivisions, they have to cooperate. So when you look at the whole room, it seems harmonious. This is a mathematical statement. It's not an aesthetic statement. It is harmonious because there is going to be some similarity. You can take one structure and then you magnify it and you see that the magnification already exists. So the, the eye and the brain tell you there is this structure and a magnified or uh, reduced copy also exists. And it makes sense because it creates coherence. And you also have symmetries where you have something here and then you have the reflection on the other side. Uh, in some wonderful buildings, you have rotational symmetry. Something rotates like a flower. And that creates coherence. Uh, so when we, when we uh, enter a room that has beautiful coherence because of these mathematical symmetries, we don't notice it. But our body registers because our body feels in a coherent environment. And then we are able to perform the function in that room where it is just to sit or listen to a lecture or work or just relax. Our body is in a healthier environment. So we don't notice the environment and we're able to do what we need to do. However, in, in a, a design environment that has uh, structures that violate symmetries, that do not have hierarchies, we feel ill at ease. And hundreds of millions of people are condemned to work in environments that make them feel ill at ease, that create anxiety in the body. So they go to work and they're forced to work in an office or in that horrible invention, Bürolandschaft, one of the worst German inventions <laughs> in the history of, of, of humanity, which is totally impersonal and, and uh, stressful for people, and you're supposed to sit there and do whatever work you do with your computer, but you feel the stress. And, and after a while, 
you start to get colds more, more frequently, or you get a skin rash. And, and you, the environment has a medical effect on, uh, on the body, but I'll get to that later. I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to science uh, for the moment. So we have, uh, we have the, the, uh, the toolbox to understand the mathematics of the environment and how it affects us. So we have the, the scaling, the symmetries, uh, um, the, 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 the principle of coherence, that all of these things that are happening uh, uh, cooperate to give you the coherence. So um, there is an ideal type of complexity that human beings feel comfortable with. And it's the type of complexity that we have evolved in, which is nature. So nature has symmetries. Uh, plants don't have much reflectional symmetry, but they have scaling symmetries. So you take, uh, you take a tree and then you, you take a piece and you magnify it and it looks very similar. And you magnify the piece and it looks very similar. But, but the tree is not symmetric bilaterally. However, the leaf is symmetric, almost. And the leaf is subdivided. And um, flowers have some flowers have rotational symmetry. So we see it there. But when you get to more sophisticated life forms, then we have bilateral symmetry. Animals are bilaterally symmetric. I mean, not only me and you, that's obvious, bilaterally symmetric. The eyes are bilaterally symmetric. We have the axis of symmetry here, the ears, but there are symmetric pieces inside. But let's go down the evolutionary scale. It's not a human characteristic. A lizard is bilaterally symmetric. That's before mammals. A cockroach. We don't like cockroaches, but as far as the structure, it is wonderfully bilaterally symmetric. The structure is absolutely magnificent. You know, the same number of legs, otherwise you won't be able to walk. So down to really primitive organisms, you, you have this bilateral symmetry. So animals have the symmetries there. And we sup are supposed to have evolved from the animals, so it is in the DNA. What I'm talking about is in the DNA. And arrogant humans say, <laughs> we don't belong to the animal world. We are like gods. We can ignore where we came from. We can shape our environment according to some fashion or style or design. Well, you do that, <laughs> you start to kill off humanity. You make people. You make people psychotic, you make people sick. Ho entire populations suffer from anxiety. Today, today we have miracles of medicine, miracles of understanding, miracles of technology, and people are psychotic and suffer from anxiety because we have constructed environments that are unhealthy for us. I mean, back in the Middle Ages, people constructed the most wonderful, beautiful environments. And those people live with famine, disease, wars, yet they constructed the most wonderful environments. And today we see those buildings and we connect to them and we say, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. Well, most of us. There are some in the population that say, this is all fashion, we want to tear it down, <laughs> build an Ikea store. Uh, but that's a, that's a different story. So that's, uh, that's part of the mathematics. There is a mathematical basis, not sophisticated mathematics at all. These are rather simple mathematics, but applied for the first time to describe, um, to describe um, rules that we can apply to create a better environment. So the, the science came first. Now I want to move to a different topic. That's continu I'm continuing, but moving to a different topic, which is biophilia. What is biophilia? It's a, it's a word that has come out in the last uh, two, three years only. Biophilia is the love of living things. Human beings love living things. We love plants, we love flowers, we love our animals, domestic animals, our dogs, our cats, even we have a fish. We love a fish. It's, it's, it's a love of, uh, of living things. And we also love other human beings. We seek the company of other human beings. Otherwise, our life is, 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 has very little meaning if we don't see other human beings. That's why uh, prisoners are punished by put, uh, put, put into an isolation cell with no contact with other human beings. So biophilia is the love, is the love of, uh, of living structure. We are now very recently able to start to explain why biophilia occurs. Biophilia occurs because of two reasons. 
First, because we evolved in nature and we evolved with plants, other animals, other human beings. So our nerves and our, our brain is geared to interact with other living forms for our own survival. We had to be able to interact with plants and we had to be able with, to interact with animals to see which animal is friendly, which animal is good to kill and eat, which animal is going to eat us, so we need to stay away from them and then interact with other humans. Since the beginning of what is a human species, we had to interpret other humans with the very, very fine uh, signals. And those are geometrical signals because we see another human and we see the, the nostrils and we see the eyes and we see the mouth and we read the expression. Be before they say anything, we read the expression. Is this a friendly human? Is this neutral? Or is this a hostile human? You can read the expression. If we did not have those subtle geometrical, mathematical cues, then we would not have survived because we don't know which human is friendly and which human is unfriendly. So to interact with other humans is part of uh, what's, what's inside our DNA that, that we have uh, become more and more sophisticated. Uh, and, and this uh, well, starts with apes because apes have the same facial recognition. Uh, they, can, they can interpret the emotions and the intentionality of, of other apes. And we have inherited that. Uh, that's the reason why very important executives or large multi multinational corporations will fly to Tokyo to have a meeting with the head of Mitsubishi. Why? Here you have an executive that's paid millions or hundreds of millions of dollars who will waste three days to fly to Tokyo to meet with the chairman of Mitsubishi. Why not talk on the telephone or talk with Skype? Because then you're, you're sitting on the same table with the head of Mitsubishi and you're having a tea or a coffee and the head of Mitsubishi says, we want to buy the power of your corporation for $500 million. And, but you read the signals because you're next to him and you read the signals and you say, this man is lying. He's going to cheat us. He wants to take over and eliminate the competition. You can't do that with Skype. Those signals are still very important. And those are mathematical signals that you can read in tiny little millimeter uh, deviations. So getting back to biophilia, I've described the first aspect of biophilia, which is what one would expect, a connection with living things. The second part of biophilia is the most exciting part because that goes back to Christopher Alexander. Many years ago, he did not use the term biophilia because it was not known then. That is to use the biological structure in artificial constructions. The obvious example is ornamentation, which I cannot point to an example here because there is no ornamentation. The so ornamentation with leaves, okay? Some of the most beautiful uh, buildings in, in Stockholm, they have an ornamentation with leaves. That's biophilia because, okay, this is stucco or stone, but you see the leaves and you connect with biophilia. You don't connect as strongly as with real leaves, but you connect fairly strongly. But then there is a, an entire that's just the tip of the iceberg, as we say. To go beyond that, there are the mathematical rules of how a leaf is put together. And you can use the mathematical rules to create an abstract composition that you can make in a window. So you create a window that doesn't look like a leaf, obviously. But those subdivisions remind you of the biological structure of a, of a plant. Here I need figures, which I don't have, uh, I've been told not to show figures, but the, the mathematics of biological structure then can be abstracted and use the same rules to create something artificial that could be a window or a door or a room or the facade of a, of a building or a section of town that has the same scaling rules and the same rules of mathematical um, uh, cooperation and coherence so that it doesn't look like a tree, it doesn't look like a leaf, it doesn't look like an animal, but you feel the same way. And uh, our, our colleague, Ann Sussman, in Boston, has done experiments as recently as six months ago to show that people recognize a face in the facade of a building. 
namely buildings that we think are very attractive and, and we go to, have a bilateral symmetry, just like the animal face, and they have something that may resemble eyes that are symmetric on both sides. And the opening is like the mouth, non-threatening. And there could be other things. You can say, well, you know, it could be nostrils or ears, very abstract. But when you look at it, yes, it makes sense. There's bilateral symmetry and you're attracted to that because in the brain there is the facial recognition of animals and human beings and that is triggered by the building and you're attracted to the building. You remember what I said earlier about the glass facade? There is the, all that is missing. It doesn't attract you. And if you need to go there because you need to enter the building, you don't know where to enter. So back to the, to the opera house that I was this morning, it has this, this symmetry. And those gold things that I happen to like, you may not like. That's an aesthetic decision. But those gold things emphasize that, that symmetry and emphasize that distorted animal face, distorted but still symmetrical, that draws you to enter. So now I have passed from the mathematical structure to biophilia, which you see can be explained by mathematical structure. And um, these experiments are extremely recent because those, uh, the, the professional disciplines that we would have expected over the last 50 years to do the correct experiments are not interested in these experiments. So we have people outside the mainstream who are our friends who are doing these experiments belatedly and to, uh, to verify what we have known all along, what, what our circle of friends who know, who have read Alexander's work have known all along. Namely that you have a minimalist facade of a building and it's, it's not there. People don't look at it. So say a government pays for a building to be a, um, uh, offices of, of a ministry, or a private corporation puts their headquarters in the building. It has a minimalist facade. They pay hundreds of millions of dollars to build such a building. And people who come to use that building cannot see it. It doesn't register, because it violates all the mathematical rules uh, that I've told you. Now, I would think that this is one of the uh, major uh, points of concern of humanity today because so many of these faceless buildings are being built and nobody mentions the fact that they are uh, um, anti-human really. And as I talk, probably one of those buildings is finished in China. And in, before I finish my talk, another one will be finished uh, in Bangkok and then another one in Buenos Aires, you know, like this. We keep repeating the same mistakes. And it's not because of ignorance. Well, the results are there. The results are published. Well, the people don't read. The, the people who can make the decisions don't read the results. <laughs> so the evolution of architecture, that's the third part uh, of my talk. Uh, going back to the beginnings of humanity when we need a shelter over our head. And then uh, as, as societies became uh, became uh, larger, more centralized, more agrarian, we started to build cities. And the cities, of course, were uh, perhaps uh, not very clean and, and not uh, organized, but they evolved, the architecture evolved because the people who built the buildings just used trial and error. You build a wall. If it's, if it's completely blank, you say, well, it looks ugly. So I'll put something on it, I'll draw something on it. If there's no window, if there's no need for a window, I will just draw something there. The beginning of ornamentation. We use feedback. We use feedback to optimize our, uh, our uh, inner feeling and therefore to optimize our environment so that we feel better in the long term. So if you're in a city, a very old city, say very primitive city, it's dirty, there is no sanitation, there's some disease, but you live in that city and in your own house and you use whatever pigments are available to put some color uh, and you can ornament it. 
so that you, you, you maximize, you try to maximize what you have control over. Those, those people did not, our ancestors did not have control over disease because medicine was, was not developed yet. They did not have control over war, wars occurred, but they had control over shaping their environment. And they did the best possible in order to have an environment that you could live under difficult conditions of those times, but you get the maximum feedback and pleasure and, and healing qualities from uh, whatever is built. Uh, this continues, of course, and it has given rise to the traditional architectural styles all over the world. So w wherever we go in the world, Africa, Asia, um, Sweden, <laughs> traditional architecture uh, embodies these discoveries of the population that uses available materials, adapts to the climate, adapts to um, the way the society works, uh, different religions, uh, adapt differently, but uh, the end result of the adaptation is to, to give a healing environment. How can I be so sure that all these different adaptations give healing environments? Because you and I can go to Tokyo and go to the traditional park and you feel wonderful. Those people are nothing like us. They have a different religion, entirely different, uh, different language, a different culture, yet we feel at home. And we go to the museum here and we see a Japanese artifacts. You say, oh, it's beautiful. Don't really understand it, but you feel it's beautiful. Those people created it so they felt comfortable and healed. And we feel the same way. Now, Japanese tourists come to Stockholm and they feel the healing part. <laughs> they don't go outside the city center. They come to the city center because a few buildings have survived the craziness. And they spend their money and they have a good time and they go to the cafes and then they go to the museums and pass in front of the opera and they enjoy it as much as I enjoy it. Just a building. So this is universal. And I want to go back to Christopher Alexander, our, our good friend and mentor. He said, the healing properties are universal. They're, they're based on the geometry. It has nothing to do with aesthetics. It has nothing to do with culture. The culture adapts the healing properties to a particular spot in a particular time, and they can change. They change over distance. They change from Central Africa to, uh, to, uh, to Taiwan. And if you stay in Taiwan over a thousand years, those properties change but uh, there is always a high degree of healing qualities. So th those are universal, universal uh, universally felt by human beings because the human being, the DNA of human beings is the same, okay? We have minor differences, skin color and the length of the nose and the color of the hair. Those are very minor. Th those are really not uh, DNA uh, differences. So human beings respond the same way. Now, the evolution of architecture comes to a a catastrophe, like uh, the extinction of the dinosaurs. <laughs> In the 1920s, for various reasons, uh, architecture changes entirely, and city planning changes entirely, and it becomes inhuman. And the strange thing is that uh, people accepted that, as, as if uh, Moses had come from, from uh, from Sinai with, with the tablets. They accepted that without questioning. So this is, is not for me to explain because it is a sociological phenomenon, <coughs> one of the great uh, disconnects in the history of humankind, why people accepted this inhuman architecture and inhuman cities after about 1920. Well, other people, not me, sociologists, anthropologists have said, well, it's due to the First World War, which there was a colossal global catastrophe. Millions of people were killed for nothing. And it, it drove people, ordinary people crazy. And I said, well, what we have done up, up until now led to the First World War, then we have to reject all the past. You have the National Socialist Revolution that destroyed Europe. That was a 
significant uh, destructive act. You have the Bolshevik Revolution, which destroyed uh, the Soviet Union. So uh, these are uh, political events uh, and, and historical events that could be used by anthropologists and sociologists to explain my question. My question, why did architecture and urban planning change and why did people accept these changes which lead to uh, uh, anxiety-inducing environments? So whether you go to Buenos Aires or Magnitogorsk or even Sweden, some places, you see the concrete blocks of the 1950s, 1960s, inhuman environments built by hundreds, by thousands. People accepted it. The governments proposed it. The governments built them. Private companies built them. The architecture schools started to teach. This is the architecture of today and the future. And what's built in the past is somehow forbidden for reasons that make no sense. I know nothing about the architecture school here. I'm willing to make a bet. 500 kroner. 500 kroner, I could go to a class today and hear a professor say, this is good city planning, where in fact it is inhuman. Because all over the world, that's what's taught. And uh, a few extremists like Architetura Peret stand up and say, no, this is terrible. It's really terrible, and we have to build better cities. And we can build better cities for the same cost. We just need to change the geometry. We need to learn from what's best in the past. And we have all the books of Alexander, and we have so many results. We have the tools right here in front of us. Yet so many professionals insist we cannot build something as beautiful today because it cannot be done. Why cannot be why can it not be done? Ah, uh, it is uh, unethical to do so. Who defines ethics? Isn't it unethical to continue to build structures that make people sick? That's unethical. No, 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 you don't understand. You need to have the honesty of materials. Yeah. What's the honesty of materials? To have horrible concrete that when, when I go by and I touch it, the skin comes off my hand because it is rough concrete. That's not ethical, that's just uh, sadistic. Why not smooth it? That's unethical because you hide the concrete. Why not put some color? That's unethical because color is, is uh, for peasants only. Uh, I don't want to quote something, you know. <laughs> the great Le Corbusier said, uh, peasants and primitive races love color. So we sophisticated Europeans writing in 1920s have to eliminate color, and we can only accept uh, uh, gray and white and perhaps just, just the um, primary colors, uh, red, yellow, and, and, uh, and, and blue, but, but nothing in between. Well, all over the world, you go to some traditional houses. And there are wonderful varieties of colors. These are poor people, and they put us to shame because there are beautiful colors. They have painted their houses because they get a boost in their health. And we who go there and see it, we also get a boost in our health. Yet here in a sophisticated, industrialized society, uh, we ha somehow feel the, 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 uh, the edict, the prohibition of color. It is iconoclasm. But then when we look at human history, full of terrible things, we see iconoclastic movements occur every few hundred years where somebody declares that uh, ornamentation, sculpture, art, color is, is, is not moral, so we destroy, we burn everything. And then after a few hundred years it comes back and then there's another iconoclastic movement. Unfortunately, that's part of human history. Uh, but. Um, Perhaps today we're intelligent enough and we are learned enough and we have the internet that we can realize that uh, people are playing with our emotions in order to, uh, to impose a sort of I ideology. Uh, but the, the, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with changing tastes. But there's something wrong when, when people impose an ideology that go against our health. 
because then we pay for medical treatments, but the simplest uh, contribution to our health, which is our environment, we, we ignore and, and we, we, we actually create the opposite of what makes us healthy. And now let me finish with uh, the, the last step, the last stage of, of the evolution of architecture, which is a descent into chaos, which is very sad, very dark. Uh, the contemporary idols of architecture are really creating the worst and worst examples of architecture. Judged by my original criterion and Christopher Alexander's criterion, they affect human health. They make us more anxious. And if we want to look at the ethics, the more we go, the more we advance, we have come to this point where architecture is totally unethical. Why do I say that? because you have the most famous architects praised by the, the global press who declare this architect is a genius. We need to hire this architect to create the building and we pay them their fee. The building is $100 million, we pay them 5 10%. That's a lot of money. And uh, we uh, appoint a jury to decide on the building. Yeah, but wait a minute. The jury is chosen from among those who value this inhuman architecture. So whoever they choose is going to be <laughs> just as terrible. It doesn't matter who they choose. They're going to choose among the name, uh, 10 names that are universally known. All 10 create terrible buildings. So it, so, so it is really a, an un unethical process. It's like voting in Bulgaria in the 1950s. OK, here's a list. <laughs> Pick one. Free elections. Well, anyone you pick is just as bad. <laughs> and then the, the uh, jury awards the prize to, uh, awards the commission to one of those 10 famous architects. Okay, so the press declares a democratic process has elected this very famous architect who will build this fantastic museum in our city. Uh, hooray, hooray, hooray. And like in North Korea, people stand out in the plaza and they say, Hooray for President Kim! Hooray for President Kim! We're going to get this wonderful museum and, and our silly little town that is so backward and we are such stupid backward people. Eventually, now we are going to rise to world prominence because we will have this museum building by the famous architect. And then the press publishes the rendering of the building. And you look at it, you know, it's tiny, it's this small. And you say, well, maybe it's not so bad. You know, it looks sort of transparent. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's interesting. So those who might have objected say, well, it doesn't look so bad. OK, it's a bit weird, but, you know, it's new. Well, you take that rendering, and you wait three years, and you take a photo of the building. The building looks like the Ministry of Truth from George Orwell. It is concrete and it is oppressive and it's hanging over you and it's destroyed the city. And you compare the two. This looks nothing like the rendering. You know, the, the rendering was at least innocuous. It did not seem like such a terrible thing. The real building is horrible. It's oppressive. It's making us sick. It has destroyed this region of the city. Never mind that you, there's no entrance and, and uh, there's no circulation. It's oppressive from all directions. And inside, it's even worse. And I take my hat off to Architectura Project, which published rendering and photo of the final building. And you see the deception. Now, we, we in the Mediterranean countries, because I am from Greece, and uh, I have worked with people in Latin America, Spain, Italy. We are dishonest people. We are lovely people, but we are dishonest people. So we are used to being cheated. <laughs> but here, <laughs> you have been cheated by these star architects. Oslo has been cheated in their new museum. 
which is a disgrace to humanity. They were cheated when we see the rendering of the museum and the final building. These are intelligent people who have been cheated and will continue to be cheated. You were almost cheated. You came this close to building a monstrosity of a museum here in Stockholm. And my friends in Architectura Project got up and said, no, this is ugly. This is terrible. And all the, all the reporters who are saying this is a wonderful building, no, they're lying. Either they're stupid or misinformed or they're lying. It looks horrible already in the plans, and when, they, when it's uh, built, it's going to be even worse. And it's going to destroy the, the waterfront of Stockholm. And I, I praise you for having the courage to organize to stop this. OK, I'm sorry. I departed from a, a calm, scientific talk in order to get <laughs> to get a little emotional. So to conclude, we have results that are mathematical. We have results now that are coming from neuroscience. And surprise, surprise, they validate what we, deep, what we feel deeply inside about if a building is friendly or if it's threatening to us. So finally, I think there's a possibility of, of using these scientific results to back up what we feel in the first place. Because 10 years ago, you say, I think this building is ugly. And the regime will say, you're stupid, you're ignorant. This building is beautiful. And you have to accept it. Because in the regime, if you disagree with the regime, you're sent into exile. But now we have the, the scientific backing. OK, I think I will stop here, and I will open for questions. Um, thank you, Nico. So I'm going to ask a few questions uh, and or invite you to ask a few questions, but I'm going to take the prerogative as the moderator to um, ask Nikos a couple of quick questions first. Um, okay, so Nikos, you talked just a moment ago about the, uh, the fact that there is now evidence of uh, some of the things that you're asserting that I know some people who are architects are... Um, probably uh, find controversial, uh, let's put it that way. Uh, first of all, I want to make the, the suggestion and get your comment on it, that perhaps what's happening is that those who are looking at architecture as a form of art, particularly as a form of abstract expressionism, um, are looking through a completely different lens than those who are actually maybe having to live in those buildings. Uh, and that may be expressing the discrepancy. And if you say, well, what's the lens? What, what do the buildings look like if you're looking through the lens of ac abstract expressionism? Maybe they're fine. Maybe they're interesting. Maybe they're profound. But they're not good habitat, because art is not habitat. Those are two different things. And there's some relationship between the two. But when they get confused, um, we're in trouble. How do you r respond to that idea? You put it very nicely in that uh, abstract art is not often habitable. Uh, art is good if it's used to enhance the geometry of good living environments. But if it destroys the livability of the environment, then it's misapplied. So the other uh, point I want to get to and uh, tease out that you talked about is the idea that we can't copy the past. And we, in particular, we can't use ornament. And that goes back, of course, to the very famous 1908 paper by Adolf Loos, the, the uh, Vienna uh, architect, who said, uh, we are beyond this primitive era of ornament and you know, uh, classical and traditional beauty. We must never do that again, because as he said it, we are culturally superior. This is what, quote, any Negro can do. That's a quote from his paper. Um, and this idea that. Um, somehow modernity means we've moved beyond this, does it not uh, seem, as we learn now from the sciences, that this is a naive idea, that actually we're turning our backs on our own essential nature, as well as our own evolutionary history? Well, the scientific results prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that ornament is a necessary part of our environment. It's a necessary part of biophilia, and biophilia creates a healing environment. Without ornament, we reduce the healing properties of the environment. Having said that, there's some 
bad ornament because we have forgotten how to produce beautiful ornament. But that's easily re relearned. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and then finally, before I um, ask the audience to ask questions as well, um, this idea that we shouldn't reuse the forms of the past um, starts to look rather strange from an evolutionary science point of view. I mean, evolutionary systems copy the past all the time, right? We have, you pointed out that we all have the sort of bilateral symmetry and lots of other properties that came from our evolution. Uh, how, how would you respond to that in terms of what we're learning from evolution and, and the nature of architecture? That question should have been answered 50 years ago. Because when we swallow something in our way, we start coughing. What, is this, what has this to do with architecture? In a f primitive fish that was our ancestor, before mammals, because this is a primitive fish, the trachea and the windpipe crossed. It's not a good solution. We inherited that. <laughs> so we reuse this mistake that the fish made in its evolution. We are what we are because we have reused some good, mostly good, and occasionally one or two bad solutions. Um, men are the ones to, to, to risk um, offensive things, but men have a problem with the urinary tract because w an animal evolution, uh, things cross and then you get problems with the prostate when you get older. That's an evolutionary small mistake that we, have, that we have inherited. So our being here alive today as the human race is based on our evolution, on reusing what we have in the past. The ears, our ears work because another primitive fish, there was the jaw bones of the primitive fish. And we can hear because the jaw bone of the primitive fish evolved to create the inner ear mechanism. So the architects in the 1920s who said, we cannot reuse the past, well, they're totally ignorant. But I don't blame them. Throughout history, you have lunatics <laughs> who go to the public square with a sign and say, do this, the world is coming to an end tomorrow. Well, society ignores them because they're lunatics. But you have some lunatics saying ridiculous things like this, we can't reuse the past, and the governments of the world believe them. And the university started to teach these ridiculous uh, sayings. So it is a society that com committed tremendous blunder. Okay, I, wanna, I was going to turn it over to the audience, but I want to ask one follow-up question, which is, is it not true that this happened basically as a way to package the industrialization of the human environment? That this was an artistic uh, product packaging, so to speak? Yes, and you can get into conspiracy theories. Uh, the industrialization around the turn of the, the beginning of the, of the 20th century started to produce enormous quantities of so-called industrial materials. Uh, steel, which Sweden benefited from, a lot of concrete, uh, and then later, plastics, and uh, they needed a way to market, to sell this material, so the companies can, can make a lot of money. Well, a way to market is to say that new buildings have to have, uh, to be built entirely of, of glass. Well, that's a boom for the plate glass industry. However, when, when you look at it from biophilia, it's good to have glass, but a completely curtain wall building is totally inefficient. It's, that's a bad idea. It's wonderful to have a plate glass window because before then, uh, glass could be very small. So you have plate glass so you can have something bigger. Okay, that's an improvement. But to have a curtain wall, the entire building on four sides to be a plate glass, it, it makes no sense. But it was a boom for the plate glass industry. Now, I'm not against a particular industry making profit. But to, to, uh, to actually ruin the, the uh, environment but in making that profit, that's just unethical. Okay, great. Let's turn it over to, yeah. Uh, and so please just ask your question in the microphone because we're recording this. And, but do speak loudly. Um, yes, uh, we've heard about, uh, very much about um, geometry. How about color, the rules for healthy color and color composition? 
Could you tell us something about that? Yes, that's part of biophilia. Uh, I, have, I have a recent paper that's unpublished, but uh, Michael Mahaffey has a copy, where I give 10 parameters for biophilia, one of which is color. So you have scaling, you have symmetries, <coughs> then you have borders, then you have color. So um, an environment that has many of those qualities will feel more biophilic, hence uh, more healthy. Um, why do we see color? Uh, we evolved to distinguish the whole spectrum of colors. It's, it's important for us. We need it, just like we need food. It's, it's essential in our... Uh, in our um but I'd like to go deeper into it. Color composition. Color composition. Well, color composition um, is something that's been totally forgotten. But uh, Christopher Alexander has a nice chapter in his volume four of The Nature of Order, where he rediscovers color composition and shows how the great painters of the past use these rules of color composition, and he has discovered the rules and he gives the rules. And it is a hierarchy of color. So you, uh, the great painters chose certain colors that agree with each other and the contrast with each other, and then the percentage present in each painting is a hierarchy. Mm. So the majority, say majority red, and then uh, one quarter of that is blue, and then one quarter of that, which is uh, one sixteenth of that, is, is green. So it doesn't matter what the shape is. Of course, the shape has to be very beautiful. Mm. But the color itself follows uh, rules of these geometrical compositions, which are the mathematical rules. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Audunen. You focused on how modernism has rejected and destroyed regional knowledge about beauty and environments all over the world. These days, there is a movement in academia called decolonization, which means that we should have more interest in uh, local knowledge all over the world and not so much on European and North American academia. Uh, sometimes it goes a bit too far. And I think in architecture, uh, a lot of modernists would say that uh, classical architecture that was built in the colonies in the 19th century is a kind of s sign of domination and should be rejected. I, I don't think that's correct because they are, it's our beauty shared with the, the colonies. So some of the best things maybe the colon colonial powers did. But should we today say that the real decolonization in architecture will be to criticize modernism, reject modernism as an ideology, and uh, support all initiatives in all over the world to rediscover their own historic knowledge of beauty and built environments. Audun, you put it very nicely, better than I could have put it. Every region in the world has this inherited store of knowledge that is invaluable because it was evolved right then, there, adapted to climate, adapted to the culture. Modernism caused the society to reject it, to throw it in the trash. It is possible to find it again and start to building with these, uh, with these almost forgotten techniques and that will lead to a much better adapted architecture that we have there. Modernism was a, a totalitarian and intolerant ideology, and still is, because modernism says you have to build a glass box in Buenos Aires and the same glass box in, in, uh, in Wellington, New Zealand, and the same glass box in Beijing. That means you destroy whatever has evolved there for a thousand years. That was that's perfectly adaptive. So, yes, including local materials, which are the most sustainable and economic, because you have them nearby and you bring them and the, the uh, uh, say, 300 years using these materials knew how to use these materials instead of uh, importing everything from the outside. That's the, that's the second part of your question. But I want to also address the first part of your question, the colonial architecture. I have read the same things. It's against lies. The British went all over the world. I do not condone what they did, but the British arrived and they took the British version of classical Greco-Roman architecture and built in India, 
they built in Australia, but they adapted it to the local conditions. So those are not the same buildings that, uh, that exist in, uh, in London or in Edinburgh. They're adapted, and, and the more you get close to the independence, the more adapted they get. And those are wonderful buildings because, okay, they have a major component of European architecture, which is not indigenous, but they have adapted. Now, unfortunately, after independence, many of the former colonies said, well, this is English, I'm going to destroy it. But some they did not. And today, they're among the most valuable parts of the heritage because they're not the foreigner who imposed the architecture, but it is the adaptiveness to the local conditions. So this amalgam of, of, a, uh, of, of a local architecture with the colonial architecture sometimes is wonderful. That architecture uh, in, in official architecture uh, culture does not exist. They claim there is no such thing as colonial architecture. It's all uh, domination. But if you look at the so-called colonial architecture, there are various degrees of adaptivity, and some of it is actually wonderful. And uh, some nations now are beginning to, uh, to realize, well, say in Singapore, the Raffles Hotel. <laughs> it's a national treasure, the original Raffles Hotel, which is an adaptive colonial, uh, adaptive to this, to the climate of Singapore, which is extremely humid. It's, it's not London, okay? It's adapted and it's uh, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, th the real colonization occurred after the 1960s when modernism was adopted and people went, the local people just built glass boxes or concrete bunkers uh, and uh, destroyed the, the local culture. That is the real colonization. And that was again the international yeah. style. Of the exactly, the international style that does not adapt to anything that just comes out of this uh, uh, absurd dogmatism of 1920s uh, modernism which uh, people refused to see the links with national socialism. The totalitarian aspects of international modernism are the brother of national socialism. But what happened is that Walter Gropius and Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, after playing buddies with, uh, with uh, Dr. Josef Goebbels and promising that the Bauhaus is the style of the national socialist future. Germany will be built according to the Bauhaus. And they made a deal with Joseph Goebbels. But then the Fuhrer stepped in and said, no, out. I'm going to have Albert Speer build the, the Third Reich. So they realized we're not going to get any work here. So they came to the United States. And they came to the United States and they said, oh, we were anti-Nazi. We had to flee. Oh, that's a lie. You left because you saw that you're not going to get any commissions. So you, you sold your soul to the Nazis. And now, you know, you pretend. It's like the... Uh, the collaborators in France. As soon as the Americans came in, those who worked with the Gestapo as collaborators, they came, oh, I was in the resistance. <laughs> yeah, but wait a minute, the resistance is, that guy was a collaborator with the Nazis, we have pictures. No, no, I was in the resistance. You know, you, the quick chameleon trick. I think that's probably uh, a, a controversial idea among many architects today that, you know, the Bauhaus was um, uh, collaborating early on, but of course there's a great uh, uh, scholarship on that by James Stevens Curl, uh, the eminent architectural historian who's just written about that in, in a book called uh, Making Dystopia. But isn't that essentially something we can understand through evolutionary theory, what you're describing? Because if you look at uh, evolutionary theory, you get cross-pollination and transfers and stuff coming from one part of the world to another part of the world, and then it, then it adapts locally, and it becomes uh, something new and differentiated, as opposed to something that's wholly transplanted and becomes, um, you know, a sort of foreign uh, implant. Don't you think you can see you can use a uh, an evolutionary model to understand these things? Yes, of course. But let me go back to the previous question. I'm sorry, I got a little excited. We should not judge international modernism as bad because of the political associations. Of course, you should judge it, but that should not be the main reason. The main reason is that it creates inhuman environments. 
That should be it. Okay, forget the politics. It creates a human environment, and you build a Bauhaus building today, it's going to be an inhuman environment. Th that's sufficient reason to reject it and to go back to what I have said earlier. Resurrect stuff from the past that works. No, what Michael said is very important. Since 1920 to 2020 now, we have discovered new materials, new techniques. Well, let's use everything that's available to build wonderful healing environments today, but according to the rules that my friends and I and Christopher Alexander have put out. There's no reason to go back to, to chipping stone. Oh, that's, it's not cost effective. If you can afford stone for a, for a uh, stunning museum, good. But we have so many uh, techniques of building today that we can use as long as we get the adaptive results. For example, I will give one example. Uh, among our loose connection of friends is a group that wants to rebuild Pennsylvania Station in New York City. It may or may not work. The, the tearing down the original Pennsylvania Station was a tremendous crime against American architecture. Pennsylvania Station was built as a copy of the Baths of Caracalla in Rome by McKean, Mead and White, but it was not built out of bricks and marble. It was built according to the latest industrial technology of the time when it was built. If uh, the committee that wants to rebuild Grand Central Station today succeeds, they will use the latest technological building innovations available today to rebuild uh, Pennsylvania Station. They will not use the original brick that was built in the Caracalla, um, and they will not use the same materials that the McKimid and White used. So it is, it is the shape, and we can adapt to the uh, to, the, uh, to the available technologies and materials. Other questions? Two here and over there. Over here? Sorry. <laughs> I haven't been seen. No. Here. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, I think we all share your frustration with the, like the press and the architects, the star architects and so on. I have a few comments in regards to, um, first you were talking about this notion of a Japanese coming to Stockholm, enjoying Stockholm, enjoying the, you know, the same things that you would enjoy in Japan and so on. But I would personally assign that more to a class system, like a global class system where certain classes enjoy the same privileges and the same, uh, let's say, uh, the same taste, uh, wherever they are, whether Japanese or American, or anything. Um, the other question I have was about modern architecture. Um, I agree with you that there are a lot of disastrous things that came out of modern architecture, but I would say that when it started, it did come. It did start with this idealism of unity, of having more kind of equality. Among, so there were certain ideals, and it was an experiment when it started. Um, in addition to, I think there's also all of these different stories or nuances in different cultures. Like Gaudi was a modern architect, for example, in for Spain, but um, he was a different type of modern. So modernism in different contexts are also, I think, a bit um, different. And then coming back to what the gentleman was saying about the colonial architecture, so um, I don't think um, the architecture that was created outside in the colonies was um, a reflection of European architecture. Because, for example, when the British were wherever they were, they were borrowing from the context they were in. So they even borrowed like, um, like one of the words, like to loot is an Indian word, which is now part of the English mm -hmm. vocabulary, for example. Bangalore. So yeah, <laughs> so a lot of the architecture was actually, it's, it's, an in, like, it's a local architecture. It was like a combination of techniques. So I don't think it's like the European aesthetics or beauty being exported to to elsewhere, you know, a lot of these structures were very much rooted in existing traditions of architecture. This is in response to the gentleman who, who kind of, who just left. So yeah, so I have these three kind of questions or commentaries. Yes, well, thank you for your comments. I, I totally agree with you with your last comment in that uh, the col most, not all, but most colonial powers would use the architecture that they found because they knew that it worked for that climate. and shape it slightly with, with the, 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 the foreign, the, fo the occupying power 
but to get a very adaptive uh, result. So those are wonderful buildings. Uh, I recently wrote a series of articles on campus design. And I, ha I looked all over the, the uh, web to find nice spaces. So I'm hosted here by the, by the Center for the Future of, of, of Places. So I, I wanted to find not buildings, but places in the campus to illustrate my, my, uh, my, uh, my series of articles. And uh, I looked, well, all the uh, typical universities. And I was not happy. And then I found universities built by the British in old India, Pakistan, using the local language, but adapting a little bit with the Oxford sort of university uh, structure. And <laughs> those, are, those are the most beautiful campus settings that I found. And, and I, I put them in my articles without, without uh, captions to illustrate uh, wonderful urban spaces in the university. So, so this is what I chose. Now, your former comment that uh, the modernists had good intentions, well, maybe yes, maybe no. I'm not a historian to judge. I judge by the result. The result if the result is unhuman, inhuman, the intentions are irrelevant. So you may not like that, but I want to judge by how human beings experience those built environments. If, there is the, if those environments create anxiety, I'm sorry, the architect may have had good intentions, but they failed to, to create good intentions there. I so I w you probably disagree with me, but th it's a point because of, of, of a specific way that I define what is good architecture. And as uh, Michael originally said, most people don't define architecture that way. Most people define architecture using different criteria. And of course, we will never agree because we're using different criteria. I wanted to um, pick up on another point, which was about the uh, 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 talking about Gaudi and, and what happened in the early 20th century. And uh, I mentioned uh, James Stevens Curl, who studied under Pevner at one time and became very critical of Pevner's idea that, uh, if you remember uh, Pevner's book about um, uh, the, uh, pioneers of modern architecture, and he included Gaudi, he included Art Nouveau, he included uh, uh, art Deco, eclecticism. There were dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of different design schools up until about uh, you know the 1920s, 1930. Um, and I think what Curl is saying, and I would certainly share this view and get your comments, is that all of that was edited out of the story. And what became the story was that there was an inexorable progression to seem modernism to uh, the, the modernism reflected in the uh, Athens Charter uh, and uh, partly the Bauhaus, but the other you know, uh, collaborators in the uh, Congress in the National d'Architecture Moderne, um, and that that became the narrative that this is what we must do in architecture. And his argument was that that has produced some pretty tragic results in terms of where we still are today. Uh, Comment. Yes, well, I didn't want to argue with this nice lady. <laughs> but Gaudi, Gaudi is our boy. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a modernist. And I, I can prove it mathematically. Uh, just look at the list of properties that I, have not, I just alluded to. The list of properties that I say, biophilic properties. And you look at Gaudi's buildings and you count. He has 10 properties of biophilia. So you look at a, a, a building by Gropius, has two properties. So Gaudi mathematically does not belong in the same class of international modernism. Yes, it depends on how you define modernism. So if you define modernism as a term, or you define modernism as a way of thinking, then it's so how do you define modernism? Because there are so many modernities around the world. Um, in the Gulf, for example, modernity so like. Do you think is in the world? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so for example, come, come up. Can, can you come up and? and uh, um, so for example, in the Gulf, uh, there was this article recently that was written by someone who was arguing that modernism was connected to the development of the ship industry, that it enabled the engine enabled to build bigger ships that could travel for longer, uh, you know, uh, space. So there is like, it depends on what, what it is. And modernity also uh, coincided with the idea of also building more sturdy buildings that were traditional in, their, in how they looked like, 
They were not the big bucks. Like the big bucks that came later in the 70s, and, and this is a different context. I'm talking here about very specifically the Gulf. So, like, I, I'm just, I'm not arguing that um, for the boxes. I'm not, it's not that I like those glass boxes. I think a lot of people find them, yeah, they cause anxiety. But there are, I think, different modernities. And, and to kind of say, um, maybe in New York, for example, that was the modern, or, you know, in certain contexts. But I mean, there's different stories and different, um, nuances to it in, in different contexts. So that's what, uh, so Gaudi was a modernist in Spain. Like he also utilized developments in technology within his building, but in a different way, but it's still, it's, it was a mod industrial, there, there were so many, even the Bauhaus produced so many um, good solutions like with the, with the other. So it's like, I don't know, I feel there is a, it's, it's more nuanced than just saying it's bad or good. So that's, that's only what I was trying to say. Okay, that's it. Yeah, well, my friends and I are trying to create a worldwide arch architectural revolution. As Chairman Mao said, a revolution is not a dinner party. A revolution is not a friendly discussion among gentlemen. A revolution is an act of violence. We wish, we have declared a revolution. So it's good to make distinctions. Otherwise, otherwise we are lost in the revolution. Now, uh, you, have, you said a lot of things, some of which I agree with. Uh, the nuances, yes. But um, I insist that Gaudi is one of us. You can call him what you want. Uh, the, uh, the nuances of modernism that are classified by Sir Nikolaus Pevsner, I totally disagree with, because I want to claim Art Nouveau is ours. Yes. Art Deco is ours, which includes the first skyscrapers in New York City. I claim that as ours for mathematical reasons. You do the count of the properties and you see that those are very high count. What I define very strictly as international modernism are the works of Walter Gropius, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, and Le Corbusier. You may not agree with that, but that's what I define in order to lecture internationally. Okay, so that's, according to that definition, th I build my case. Well, and I, I um, this is where maybe you and I have disagreed in the past as, as friends and collaborators, but, um, uh, rather than just sort of define an enemy because you're trying to build a movement, I think we can be very precise and say that uh, there was indeed a momentous shift with the CIEM, with the Congress International de Architecture Moderne, led by Gropius, uh, Le Corbusier, uh, and Mies, among others, uh, to a, uh, a, a particular model of architecture, which I think a great argument can be made persists in, in many different permutations. But I think we do need to be able to, um, you know, say what are sort of unifying theoretical ideas in some forms of architecture that still persist, in most forms of architecture that still persist. I, th I, I agree with her in, in the sense that I think it's, it's a semantic uh, problem mm -hmm. because modern, actually uh, the break with classicism came with Art Nouveau. It, it was called an Art Nouveau, that means the new art. And also Modernista, which is the, f the, the Spanish version of Art Nouveau. So it, I think what the, the modernist, the, the, the anti-architecture <laughs> uh, modernists, ha they, have, they have kidnapped the word modernism yes. and they yes. have made it theirs. They have made anti-architecture into the modern thing. And they have connected it with democracy, with women's liberation. All these things already started and all uh, way before, many, many s decades before. So they kidnapped the modern movement. And I think this may be your point. They kidnapped the beautiful modern movement that was evolving just like the body. It was evolving into something more beautiful, more uh, Art Nouveau was bringing in, instead of just old classical uh, symbols going back to, uh, right. th they, they brought in nature 
um, women's liberation had already started, democracy had already started, all these beautiful uh, garden cities thinking about the worker, uh, creating beautiful environments for the worker had already started. What this was that you are describing was the, I don't know, counter-modernism, wh which was like a movement that just killed everything, a destructive movement. It, it is actually future, it's not modernism, it's futurism. And futurism comes, as we all know, from Marinetti, which is, a, that wants to destroy everything. So it's future, it sh maybe should be renamed into futurism because it's futurism that is it's, it's going on today and they're building a future that we don't want. So maybe we can redefine it. Well, of course, you write about the semantic aspects of these discussions and the need to be precise and talk about the ideas behind them. You know, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but uh, Gothic architecture, do you know what it was called? It wasn't called Gothic architecture. That was a put down. It's like it's barbarians made this stuff, so it's Gothic, the Goths. It was called the modern style. <laughs> that was the name of it at the time. Let me add one word. Yeah. Let me add one word. They destroyed the word modernism. We have to find a new word because er otherwise nobody will understand anything. Maybe we should call it new modernism. Yeah. Well, we can think about that. Your, your comment? <laughs> yes, well, yeah, I want to comment on that. Inger brought up an extremely important issue, a terrible act of assassination, because around uh, 1900, you had tremendous architectural innovation and urban innovation. New ideas of town planning that broke away from the medieval town planning, but very human town planning, wonderful experiments that are successful. Today, new towns of 1900, 1905, 1910, wonderful, because they, they have the pedestrian part and the new, newly arrived automobile, but was not allowed to take over. So a wonderful blend, nice balance that, w that we are incapable of achieving today. The architecture, the Art Nouveau, the Art Deco, all over the world there is something that officially doesn't exist. It has been censored. It is eclectic architecture, developed between 1900 and 1930, 1935. Eclectic architecture, the most wonderful architecture because it used the, the new industrial uh, materials but in an adaptive way. Well, what I say is Bauhaus modernism sort of took the uh, took, uh, embraced all of that and said, this is all modern, and then they crushed it. Because it was their competition, it was so much better than the Bauhaus modernism. They crushed it and eliminated it. And today in the architecture schools, when you show a building from 1920, 1930, they say, this is useless, this is rubbish, this is eclectic, it has no place in architectural history because they still have orders from the Bauhaus. Kill this, because it's better than what we do. And if you let us survive, we will not be able to take over the world and build these horrible uh, uh, cubes, uh, concrete cubes and glass well, boxes. They, they said something more elegant than that, right? They said it's not modern. I mean, in that sense, they made a claim to modernity and said anything else is not modern, it's, it's reactionary, it's part of the old political ideology or part of some, you know, a moribund uh, uh, regime and, uh, and they, they were brilliant, uh, you have to say. We have time for one more question. Tigran, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I've been uh, hanging out a lot with high on this at Howard Davis. Uh, so, so I've been uh, the last. We've been drinking many times beer. So I'm, I'm familiar from Christopher Alexander from another perspective, uh, and uh, so so the first thing is uh, this is a very Christopher Alexander question. How much is the really in the nature of order as a kind of a literal concept and bio biophilia? Because y you can kind of see uh, some kind of a, well, I, I put it here like. A, uh, how much is linked to biophilia, how much to human uh, perception and symbolics that we have to kind of abstract forms. Because, because if you see, you can make parallel in language, so you can find beautiful words and beautiful patterns 
Uh, so so uh, is it a biophilia, just a new term, or, or you, you can find, and that also links to this kind of question of modernism, because if we have the symbols, if the symbols change, these initial symbols, then maybe it's possible to accept any kind of architecture without so much stress. Then we will be more resilient to stress if we kind of accept this kind of social symbols, like we're perfect cube or perfect purism. So how, how do you kind of find biophilia as a kind of a determinant versus something that could be kind of a, can be a ideal forms that we can kind of figure out and learn through several generations, they become a kind of a, a culture that, because uh, Christopher Alexander really links to culture. So what we, if we create a progressive culture, a futurist culture? So that, that is my question between this kind of struggle, the culture versus biophilia and, and then the patterns as kind of an abstraction about cities and architecture and so on. Well, yes, I'm not sure I understand the question, so I'm not sure I can answer the question. Let me try to, uh, to say something. However, um, my friends and I are basing our research on Christopher Alexander and going further to include the results of uh, neuroscience today and trying to rebuild an entire discipline that was uh, gutted, erased. So it's like trying to rebuild science that has been erased after barbarian invasion or the ex explosion of a volcano. Science is very large. So the, the science of architecture that we're trying to, uh, and city building that we're trying to resurrect requires, say, biology to be rebuilt, chemistry to be rebuilt, physics to be rebuilt, geology to be rebuilt, because all of that information was thrown out of the architecture school. So we're trying to rebuild that. Biophilia is one important topic. It's not everything. The patterns form another piece of that, and they mesh very nicely, just like chemistry meshes with biology. You know, it's an overlap, the different disciplines, but when you go to the border, they make sense. You can transition from one to another. So if you read my latest paper on biophilia, I, I show the patterns were which connect to biophilia. So there's a nice transition. This is called consilience by Edward Wilson. The linking of scientific topics. Where there's no linking, you have to be suspicious. Now, the patterns include patterns that are not biophilic. They have nothing to do with biophilia, they have to do strictly with geometry. Those patterns link to the nature of order, which is more geometrical. And the patterns link up here with the culture. So we're building a tapestry of different disciplines and filling in the different disciplines. We are working as hard as we can, 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week for the last 30 years. And we're filling in these. And hopefully we are starting to create a picture of, 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 the, of resurrected science of architecture and urbanism. And Christopher laid the groundwork for this and other people, we're connecting those dots. But I think the point that you make is a really important one, which is the idea that, well, if language is um, uh, open-ended and culture is open-ended, shouldn't architecture be open-ended? And I think the answer to that would be yes, but it isn't relative, it isn't um, um, random. There are some things, just like there are, I can say some things in language that make no sense, or I can say some things in language that are upsetting to a given audience. I can do the same thing in architecture. And the question is, what are the ethical uh, duties that I have as a professional and as somebody who's not just making my own art, but making a shared environment, uh, a public creation, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, a Tigger wants to say something. He, he, he invited me. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'll I'll stand up. Yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna wrap it up because I think Michael did a nice job in the and in, in the um, moderation of this. But I would like to say that this, and I spoke to my colleague and friend Peter Elmond from the Urban City Research. This is your talk is a cornerstone for a series of uh, very interesting roundtables and expert seminars we're gonna do on modernism in the coming one or two years. Uh, not that we're gonna get to the bottom of things, but we're gonna try to place them in architectural schools. Sort of for some enemy territories, for some hostile territories, for some domestic territories. So I think this is the beginning for this wonderful, I would say, expose that um, Nikos has given. And the second thing is just a small vignette that I remember 
when the Maxi Museum was done in Rome, uh, Zaha did some signature star architecture building, which was looked more like Battlestar Galactica than a real museum in a, in a uh, centuries-old city. Uh, Michael Orosov, who was the major critic of New York Times, former one, wrote this long article in two pages uh, praising this building and ending it to the audience saying this, embrace it, my fellows, because imagine Bernini, Borromini, and Guarini, they were, what they were being told that their stuff was terrible at that time. Maybe Zaha did in 100 years will be like these three guys. They will say this is a masterpiece. So I'm just saying, as you said, that the global press does continue and everybody accepts this. So I think the second battle would be to go, how do you go against this? How do you change the perception of global press? What is actually beautiful, what is not? Because aesthetics, you took that up a few times, the aesthetic values, we don't talk about what is beautiful, what is ugly anymore. It's not even politically correct to say this building is terrible. The B word. The B word. Uh, so I'm not going to wrap it up. I think this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Nikos. I think we all learned a lot. Uh, even though maybe with some elements we don't agree. That's the whole point. You can't agree with everything. We might disagree. But it's a s stepping stone, a cornerstone for a, for a lot of things to come. And I know there's a number of uh, guys you hear from architectural. Ar um, how do we say this in English? The architect. Rebellion, yeah, that's the revolutionary guard. So I think we'll continue the discussions, and I hope to, that you will come back again. I know you're not fond of travel anymore, but we'll try to get you back again. So please, a warm uh, hand of applause for Nikos.